All right, good morning, Bible Baptist Church. It's good to have you all here. Good to see some visitors here this morning. We have a couple of announcements, so please bear with me as you're filing into a pew there. First things first, man, it's good to be in church on a Sunday morning. Amen, it's good to be here. Uh, We have just one thing up front here in regards to our social media stuff that's going on. Right now we are going live there with Switcher. And uh, uh, Brady's man in that back there. Everybody give a a nice wave to Brady. Make him feel nice and embarrassed this morning. Thank you, Brady. Uh, Something that we wanted to make mention of. This past week, we had a social media meeting specifically to see since the last two weeks that we did uh, what we did up here to let everybody know and aware of the new website and uh, all the different uh, things that we're connected with. We've had, I think it was a 66% increase in traffic on all of those things. Here's what that means. If you type in Baptist Church, Seymour, Tennessee, just to search for a Baptist Church here, we are number one on the list of it through Google there. So whoever is searching, if they just want to find out a Baptist Church in Seymour, Tennessee, there we are. So praise the Lord for that. Thank you guys for um, going on there and creating that foot traffic for it. But with that being said, there's still not a lot of people that are sharing the post, in particular the services of what's going on here. Uh, I think the average is about six to maybe eight people, give or take, ten people. Okay, so that's about the average of people that are sharing that. With just around anywhere between six to ten people sharing it, we were able to reach, um, for instance, the Manic Monday, the thing that Preacher does, it's very quick. We, the highest one that we've uh, reached out was 700 and 775, and that's with anybody from six to ten people sharing that. If ten to twenty people shared it, that, would, that number would increase. It would double that, if not even more. So please keep that in mind with ever what's going on there. Here's what I would love for you folks to do this morning. You guys are here at Bible Baptist Church. If you go in on Facebook, if you have a Facebook account, you can pull up the church uh, uh, page there, and off to the right it has some dots that you can click on, and you can check in here at the church this morning. That creates a lot of that foot traffic that I was mentioning. There's several churches in this area that pay hard money to get that number one slot that we just did, and we didn't have to pay a dime. Why? Because you guys had created foot traffic on it and other folks sharing that. So keep that in mind this morning, if you wouldn't mind clicking on Facebook, even as I'm doing this announcement here, and just check in here to Bible Baptist Church. That helps. That helps an awful lot. All right, now that that stuff is out of the way. Fox Fire Mountain, the youth are going to be heading to that on 912 So if you have any questions about what's going on up there, they've got zip lines, they've got all kinds of things. Please see Brother Daniel over here. He'll give you some more information. The Adventure Club has kicked off officially. We're now two weeks into it here on Wednesday nights. We try to treat it like a uh, vacation Bible school, very fast-paced, have exciting games going on. We've got snacks. We've got uh, teaching going on. We've got Bible memory verses. And uh, we've got a lot of stuff planned for the next month and a half, almost two months. One being next Sunday, we're having a river rat trip of tubing over in Townsend. So if if you would like to go and you've not mentioned it to Josh and I that you would like to go, please see us after the service. We'll make sure that uh, all that's squared away. But with that being said, please bring clothes for it. Please bring appropriate attire for that. Uh, Sunscreen, snacks, towel, things of that nature. If you would like to reimburse the church for any of it, because we're going to try to take care of that for the folks that are going, it's about $10 per person, give or take. So just keep in mind, in the next Sunday, we'll make another announcement about folks gathering up here so that we can have a game plan heading up there. All right. Uh, Back to School Bash is going to be August the 12th. Uh, we're going to have that out front here for all of the kids and have a great time with the inflatables, with food and all the wonderful stuff that we do for uh, Back to School Bash. All right, construction is still going on in the back. If any of you guys have not peeked your head out the back door, please do so today to see what's going on. It is very exciting. Uh, Hey, it's starting to look like a building back there. Praise the Lord for that. And it's moving uh, uh, forward very, very quickly. So with that being said, please keep in mind that stuff is going on back there. There are plenty of things that your children could get hurt on. So let's try to keep them away from back there unless there's adult supervision. All right, last but not least for me this morning, we're having a baptism after this morning's service. 
Praise the Lord for that. Uh, we're going to bring a bucket of water and we're going to dip your face. No, I'm kidding. We're not going to do that. We're not. <clears throat> Directly after this morning's service, we're going to head over here to Seymour uh, Community Church just right down the road here. It's less than three minutes away. Uh, they have a baptismal pool that we're going to gather in there after this morning's service and do a quick baptism and then go home from there. So please keep that in mind and we'd love for everybody that can go over there to support those that are being baptized this morning. All right, kids, let's get ready for your Sunday morning offering in the little yellow school bus. That, that's the social media bus right up front here, in case you guys didn't know. Countdown in three, two, one, go! All right, let's do some singing this morning. Josh? Amen. We'll grab a hymnal and turn to page number 258 as we sing, He Hideth My Soul.
Amen. Great singing. You may be seated. At this time, we'll go ahead and take up our offerings. If I could have a couple of uh, ushers come forward to be able to take up the offering. Um, I'll go ahead and give a short word of testimony. Uh, I was raised in a Christian home. Uh, praise the Lord for that. Many people aren't able to say that. And so, uh, you know, from <laughs> the time that I was born, I was, I was in church. And uh, I, I got the, had the opportunity to be able to hear the gospel from a young age. And because of uh, a children's church ministry of where I was, um, I was able to hear the gospel and respond at just uh, seven years old. Uh, to be able to trust Christ as my Savior. To know all my sins are forgiven. And to just be able to uh, uh, walk in the Christian life. And so I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for a godly heritage. It doesn't matter uh, uh, where we are in life. We want to be able to leave a godly heritage for the next generation. And so I'm thankful for that in my own life. Let's go ahead and pray over the offering. Lord, we just uh, thank you for this day, God. The ability to gather in your house. Lord, we just uh, pray over this offering now, Lord. That you would just uh, take everything that is given and use it to... Uh, further uh, the cause of the gospel and the ministry of this church, Lord. Just add your blessing to it, Father, and help us to give you all the honor and glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Okay, let's pray. Lord, thank you for uh, this service already, the fellowship we've had here today, the Sunday school time, or this uh, music that's reminded us of how good you are to us and the fact that you are our, uh, our fortress. And uh, God, thank you for uh, all your promises. Give us wisdom in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's see what Delta has put in the bag. Got a hat. You want to hold that for me, Riz? Yeah. <clears throat> Who is that? It's a little snow cone bunny. That's a snow cone bunny with a little pink birthday hat on. I see what Delta's done here to me. Are they stickers? Happy, Merry Christmas, right? Is that Santa Claus? Mm -hmm. Okay, you want to hold that? Mm -hmm. All right. Where's my hat, Reese? <laughs> Let's see here. <laughs> there you go. How about that? That's right. I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach like this today. Your, your parents will never be able to pay attention. <laughs> what did you say? This was the snow cone bunny? Does it have a name? No. No name. No. Snow Cone Bunny. All right. Wow. What in the world am I going to say about a Snow Cone Bunny? <laughs> and there's stickers of Santa Claus and a Christmas tree and, and a star, right? A Christmas star. What is that right there? It's a polar bear. A polar bear. And then I have a hat and, and pink glasses. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, Gage, Gage says you look like a girl. <laughs> Thank you, Gage. I don't think this is the appropriate time for me to talk about that. You look like a crazy person. Okay, all right. I better take it off or you'll never be able to pay attention. <clears throat> now, just give me a minute here. Let's see if I can figure something out. Right? Anybody want to help? Any parents want to step in here and help a little bit? Huh? The seasons? The four seasons? Okay, yeah. Summertime. Christmas time. Well, that snow goes with Christmas time. I could do something there, couldn't I? I have a plan. I have a plan. I did, yeah. Could you get that for me? <clears throat> okay, sometimes, sometimes things are not as they appear, okay? We've talked about Simon Peter before, and when Simon Peter denied the Lord, when you looked at him saying dirty words and cursing and, and denying that he knew the Lord, that didn't, that wasn't right. It just didn't go, it didn't look like him, okay? So, Every now and then, now you've got you to really pay attention here. I'm going to have to pay attention to myself make sure I get this. Every now and then here, you do some things and say some things that are not good. They're not really you, right? Paul sort of, Paul, when he wrote the letter to the Corinthians, he wrote a letter to them that said to them, you all are acting like babies and you're carnal and you're saying things and doing things that are not right. They're, you say you're Christians, but that's not Christianity. So sometimes when you do things and say things that you should not do or say, what you're doing is you're, you're allowing the world to look at you in a way that you really aren't that way, right? That's not who you are. But when they look at you, that's what they see, right? Like Gage said, you look like a girl, right? So I've put something on here that makes me look like something that I'm really not, all right? So your actions and your speech, your heart, your attitude, those things, they cause other people to look at you a certain way. And sometimes you only get one chance. Sometimes you only get one chance to try to talk to people, make an impression on them. And if you do things that are not right and you say things you shouldn't say, then that, this is how they remember you. <clears throat> they don't remember you like, maybe like this, 
right? When they, when they think of you, Oakley and Grayson and, and Griffin and Paxton, when they think of you, they should think of the Lord, how good He's been to you, the Word of God, how forgiven you are, those things. But the, you've given them a bad picture. See that bad picture? It looks right on her, right? Right? Mm-hmm. Now, if you, if you give them the right picture then I promise you the judgment will work out better for you. It'll be, uh, what is this thing right here? Snow cone bunnies. It'll be stickers and snow cone bunnies. Happy, happy time, right? <laughs> you got to think about that. You got to think about how's this going to work out for me when I face the Lord? Is it going to be happy, happy time? Or is it going to be, oh no, I wish I wouldn't have said that or done that, right? Okay. You want to say something? Good. I love you. Good. That'll work. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you again for these young people. Bless them like only you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Delta. Amen. Well, as they make their way back, go ahead and stand with me one more time. Turn to hymn number 256, It Is Well With My Soul.
great singing. You may be seated. Let's stand. I want to read just a couple of verses in 1 Corinthians 15. Um, we're, we're on, I think, part five here. Um, we're running through the Word of God and uh, finding just a few examples. There are many. Finding a few examples of the grace of God. <clears throat> Am I talking to the right people? Has God been gracious to you? Mm-hmm. Wow. Uh, we are the 
uh, beneficiaries of the Lord's grace. And many times I don't think we even realize that. Yet it's there. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse, let's see here, let's read verses 9 and 10. And uh, this is uh, the Apostle Paul giving us what we know as the gospel for us, the good news that the Lord Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. And then he goes into uh, this thing here where he talks about there being at least 500 brethren at once seeing the Lord. And then he was seen of James and then of the apostles. And then actually in verse 8 he says, And last of all, he was seen of me also as one born out of due time. So uh, Paul the apostle was born again on the road to Damascus when he met the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Right? You get that from here. But I think probably just like us, when Paul thinks about his conversion... I want you to think about that for a moment. When were you saved? And then think about sort of the events that led up to that, maybe where you were, and then what's transpired and how God has been not only a part of your life but living in your body since you've been saved, right? So when Paul sort of writes that down and he's reminded of that, then he says what's found in verses 9 and 10. For I am the least of the apostles. So when you get to thinking about your conversion and then all the things that God has done for you since you've been saved, not just monetary blessings, not just homes and cars and stuff, but just his provision for you, his answers, his wisdom, his protection, the right people that he's put in your life, the wrong people that he's kept away from your life and your family, all those things. It's in you to think, why would he do this for me? I'm the least. Paul is our pattern for living, but he says with a clear conscience, I'm least, right? He says, For I am the least of the apostles that am not meet to be called an apostle. I shouldn't even be called that. That's not a match meet. We should think of the apostles and then, oh yeah, by the way, Paul. That's the way he looks at himself. Come on, amen? The right way for your preacher to look at this is, oh, there's this Bible Baptist church and I'm not even worthy to be in the congregation, yet God has allowed me to be the pastor of this church. That's the right way to think about it, huh? And then he says, because, oh, here's my problem. I remember how bad I was. We're pretty bad, folks. We don't remind ourselves of that enough. We allow the world to talk us into the fact that we're real good. Well, we're really not. He says, because I persecuted the church of God. There are only three groups. I think you find that in 1 Corinthians 10, about verses 30, 31, 32, something like that. There's Jew, and then there's Gentile, and then there's the church of God. Three groups. And once you get saved, then you're in the church of God. And now, these days, in our dispensation, it doesn't matter. Jew or Gentile, hallelujah, you're in the bride, bride of Christ, in the body of Christ, adopted into the family, Right? But he says, that body, that family of God, that, that church, I persecuted them. Verse 10, can you look back at your past and before you got saved and, and with a clear conscience, really be honest with yourself and think, you know, I don't deserve to be in church with a good suit of clothes on today. I don't deserve to be saved. These, these people are my people, but I don't deserve to be able to say that. Verse 10, how does all that take place, Paul? But by the grace of God. I am what I am. He says, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. He says, I labored more abundantly than they all. All the apostles. He says, I'm, I, 
I can know what's going on here. I worked hard. And then he says, oh, uh, he's got to catch himself. Uh Uh-oh, hold on. But it wasn't me, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. This is called Grace Gallery, so I'm trying to paint a picture of grace for you in some, some of these stories in these people's lives. And today it's going to be ramblings from the preacher, okay? I'm going to try to... You ever see those paintings where they just dip a brush or a stick or something in, in paint and then just sling it up on the canvas? <laughs> I'm going to take some snippets from Paul's life and maybe a little snippet from Simon Peter's testimony, and we're just going to throw it at the canvas and see what happens here, Right? Pray with me. Father, thank you for your presence here and the fact that uh, we're we're so undeserving, but you meet with us. We're so undeserving, but you you come here and you get in the testimonies and the song service and all the fellowship here and you encourage and exhort and rebuke us and we need all those things. God, please help us here today. I pray you'd help me to say the right thing. Shut it off when it's time to shut it off and keep going when it's time to keep going. God, please give me the wisdom that I need and the utterance that I need. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can be seated. Now, uh, Paul had some, uh, some growth in this process uh, about himself, and we all have that. We all, uh, I don't think that when you first get saved, you realize how bad you really are. Uh, how bad you, you really were before. Come on, amen. How many of you have learned that since you've been saved? You've, you've got this look back, this real biblical look back at yourself, and you think, um, I thought I was okay, but well, I was a pretty bad person. I hurt a lot of people. I deceived myself, right? You can see that in Paul's life. It says in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5, Paul says, For I suppose I was not a whit behind the very chiefest apostles. So he first, when he, when he first gets saved, even first part of his Christian life, he says, I'm, I'm not a whit behind the chief of apostles. But then you come to Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 8, and that's been deflated a little bit, where he says, Unto me who am less than the least of all saints... Is this grace given? So now he's come a little further and he says, I'm the, I'm the least, less than the least of all saints. And then you go to 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, and he ends up saying, you know what? Just forget those statements back there. I'm the chief among sinners. <laughs> I'm the worst, right? When you find an Indian tribe somewhere and you ask them who their leader is, they'll say, that's the chief right there. Paul says, you, you find this tribe of sinners, right? I'm the chief. I'm the, I'm the leader. I'm the worst one. I'm the epitome of that, right? So we need that growth, and the only thing to give us that is this book. Your opinions and your feelings and what the world thinks about it won't, I don't care what psychologist or psychiatrist you go to, they won't give you the right look at who you really are, who you've been, and where you're going. This is the only book that will do that. This book will tell you where you've been, you messed up here, this was a success, and then it'll tell you where you're going to be, who you're going to end up with, how you're going to end up in the future. There's no other book like that. We have a good heavenly father. Amen. Amen. Now, back in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul had a good look at who he really was so he could get real with himself. And I think that's what I'm really trying to get you to do here today is get real with yourself. And I want you to realize that, that the grace of God and the avenue of the grace of God and what you have there in the grace of God will allow you to get real with yourself. So... We don't have an alibi, but we have an antidote, I guess. So I can say now with a clear conscience how bad I really was before I got saved because I know lurking in the back and even in the front of my mind and in the scriptures is I can follow that statement with, yeah, but the grace of God. But for a lost person or someone who won't look in the mirror and get real with themselves on a regular basis... They shy away from that because they don't have the grace of God to add on to the end. I I don't blame them. You ever wonder why someone justifies their own devilment? Right? When when they know that they missed it, they made mistakes, they 
They can't get real with themselves but because they can't tag on the end of that the grace of God. And you ever wonder why people will do that with you too? Have you ever tried to get real with someone in a conversation and just say, you know, especially people that you were with before you got saved, friends, acquaintances, co-workers, and you, you acted a certain way with them and around them before you were saved, and then you run into them after you're saved, and you start to apologize to them, Brother Mitch, and you say, look, I'm saved now, but when I was with you and when I worked with you, I acted this way and I said that, and what they'll do is they'll say, oh, no, 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 it wasn't that bad. You know, you, you weren't that bad and you this. And no, they know all along while they're saying it that I was despicable. I was a wretch. But they're just trying to play that off. It's not just because it's an embarrassing situation. It's because they can't tag the grace of God onto the end of that. Because they could get real with me and just say, you know what, you were pretty bad. And I've had a couple of people do that. You know what, you were pretty bad. But the grace of God. Right? So here in the passage, he, it teaches a lot of things, but it teaches that if you'll just buy into and realize how gracious God has been with you, I think you can get real with yourself. That's why people put on a show. They don't have the grace of God, right? We need to face who we really are and, and, and allow the grace of God to back us up. Now, <clears throat> look at Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Come over to Romans chapter 5 and let's read verse 20. Paul goes on here in 1 Corinthians and says, I labored more abundantly than they all. That sounds puffed up. But then he tags on the end of that, yet not I. But it's the grace of God that dwells in me. It's not just me that does that. So you can get real with yourself, not only about how bad you were, but you can get real with yourself about how good you were. Now, what I mean by that is, sometimes even as saved people, you do the right thing. Am I in the right church this morning? Do I just need to stay on that first point and then have an altar call? Sometimes we make good decisions. Sometimes you walk away from a conversation and you know, you have assurance from the Holy Ghost that I said what I needed to say right there. Thank you, Lord, right? But Satan doesn't quit at that point. He says, look at you. You, 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 got your, uh, you got your union card for Christianity. Now you're in. Right? And then he plays on your goodness and you feel puffed up. So the grace of God will allow you to say, I was really bad, but the grace of God. And now that you're saved, the grace of God will allow you to say, you know what? I did that right. But if it weren't for the grace of God, I know me, I would not have done that right. It wasn't just me that did that. I did the right thing. Paul is saying here in this passage in 1 Corinthians 15, you see all the apostles? I worked harder than them. But it's justified because he knows he worked harder than them. He's our pattern for Christian living. But he has to tag on that. Look, it wasn't me. It was just the grace of God that allowed me to do that. <clears throat> Thank God for the grace of God. Amen. Amen. Romans 5, look at verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Paul knows that sin does abound from time to time, and either we do the wrong thing or we do the right thing, and then we're inflated because we did the right thing and we give ourselves credit. So what we have to remember is when sin abounds, whether it's pride and ego or it's just doing the wrong thing, if you come out unscathed and everything works out just fine, then it's the grace of God and nothing else. We all deserve to be in hell with broken backs, with the door shut and never ever able to get out again. And but by the grace of God, we don't have to go there. We all deserve to be in a much sorer position than we are now just economically. But look, look around. It's the grace of God that we are here in an air-conditioned building. It's working a little harder today, but it's keeping up pretty good. Nice clothes on. Most everyone in here is pretty healthy. There's some health problems here and there. Come on, amen. <coughs> just the grace of God. Paul's not being arrogant. 
But because of the grace of God, he's extremely motivated to do right and be right and say the right things and go to the right places. I'm convinced that if God's people will take just a little time to think about how gracious God has been to them then it will be an extreme motivator for them to be faithful, to lose the apathy, to be better soul winners, to pay more attention to this book, to try to seek out and find people that are saved, that they can be a blessing to somehow. I'm convinced that if you think about how gracious God has been to you, then you'll look around and say, Lord, show me somebody. I need to help somebody. And it will also motivate you to say in, in the morning when you put your feet on the floor, God, show me somebody today. Somebody needs you. There, there's, I come in contact with a few people in a day now. There's going to be somebody that's lost, I bet. Now, Lord, I don't want to force a door open, but the, the best doors are the doors you open up. And I, God, I know how you, good you've been to me now. And I know I'm saved and I know where I'm going. There's somebody out there that needs you now. Help me. It'll extremely motivate you if you realize how gracious God has been to you, right? Amen. Now, First uh, Timothy chapter one. Let's. Uh, I'm going to skip ahead here just because of uh, uh, time's sake. Let me say this on the way by. First Timothy chapter one. Without grace, we just live in a system of works that won't will never be fruitful. If we don't realize now, are you saved? You have had grace bestowed upon you. Now you need to realize that. Let me give you an example. Some of you in here were raised by parents who loved you and provided for you and took care of you and the food, the clothing, the, the room, the board, the, all the stuff, all the stuff, the love, the nurturing, the healing you up when you had wounds and all the stuff. But it took you until you were about 25 or 30 or 35 to realize, oh, my parents were so good to me. I had no idea. Now, some of you didn't have that. But some of us did. Right? When you got saved, God bestowed upon you His grace and mercy and forgiveness. Now, you can't tell me that five minutes after you were saved, you realized all that theologically. Most of you are like me. You know what you knew? Oh, I don't have to go to hell. My sins are all forgiven. Boy, I should have done this a long time ago. And then you get in Sunday school and you start to learn about imputation and the infallibility of the Scriptures and all the, the things that God has protected you from before you got saved, and all the handfuls of purpose, and all the things that He's done for you, and you start to realize those things, and you think it, that some of you in your life at some point have had to come apart and say, God, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize how good you were to me. Amen. You see, the grace was there. You just didn't know anything about it. If you don't realize how gracious God has been to you, then you will live a, an, a fruitless, non-profitable Christian life. We don't want that. I'm convinced that at least one of the keys to your success as a saved person to be fruitful is to realize how gracious God has been to you. <clears throat> now, where did I tell you to go? 1 Timothy 1. Yeah, that's it. I got carried away. That was fun too. 1 Timothy 1. I think I just quoted a little bit of this. Look at verse 12. 1 Timothy 1, 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy, but I did it ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Could he, is there anybody else in here besides the preacher that could stand up today and say, listen, God's grace to me was exceeding abundant through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I know you know that now that you read it, but you, do you really know that? See, 
Do you really realize how gracious God has been to you? Verse 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now quickly, come over to 2 Peter chapter 1. I want to uh, throw uh, Simon Peter's um, effort onto the board here. Let's look at 2 Peter chapter 1. Uh, Paul was, we can say this now, not bragging on him, but bragging on the grace that worked through him. Paul was an amazing example. In fact, he is the pattern of what a Christian should be. He wrote 13, probably 14, at least a portion of 14 books in our New Testament. And he would not have been able to do that if he wouldn't have from time to time realized and lived his life in a way that reminded him and everybody else of how gracious God had been to him. Um, he was eventually gracious toward a fellow named John Mark that frustrated him in the ministry early on. And then eventually he said, bring him, he's profitable. I think it's times like that when you realize how gracious God has been to you that you're willing to offer that grace to other people. Some people make mistakes in the ministry. Some church people make mistakes. Now, I know at other churches, not here, Brian, but <laughs> Some people hurt you with their lack of faithfulness, like John Mark and things like that. They say things they shouldn't say. They're hurtful, right? Things, things. But when it comes right down to it, and you're reminded of how gracious God has been to you, why don't you just go ahead and say, you know what? I can forgive you. If the Lord's forgive me how bad I am, I can forgive you. Amen. Now, I'm not talking about justifying sin. You've got to be careful there, right? Gross sin, especially. But you can show some grace from time to time. I think it'd be good for you. 2 Peter chapter 1, here's what Simon Peter says in verse 4. 2 Peter 1, 4, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. Are you saved? You should, be, you should be, on a regular basis, a partaker of the divine nature. The divine nature is God's nature. Divine, right? You know, the problem with most Christians we know, including me from time to time, a lot, we're not partakers of a divine nature, we're spectators to the divine nature. We're good at plopping down on the pew and watching what God's doing, what the preacher's doing, what the deacon's doing, what the piano player's doing, and we spectate good. That's what we're good at. Buy a ticket. In fact, it's free 99 to get in here, right? <laughs> Buy a ticket, come in and spectate, right? Look around. You're never, ever supposed to be just a spectator. You're supposed to be a participant, partaker, right? Now, he says, And by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. We've escaped that by the grace of God, so that should push us to be a partaker. Verse 5, And beside this, giving all diligence. Now, here's what we're supposed to add to what we already have. We're supposed to add, he says, to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, temperance, to temperance, patience, to patience, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Your problem is, you're like me, you'll pick a couple of things out on the list that you think you're okay at. And you won't focus at those things in that list that you're not really that good at. Right? Verse 8 says, for if these things be in you, but they can't just be in you, they have to abound. So you've got to learn these things and try to get good at these things. Because of the grace of God bestowed on you, you and I should take a look at these things and try to make sure that we at least know what they mean, how to perform them, and then we're put to the task and we just can't let them be in us. We have to make sure they abound through us. Now I could stop and have an altar call right now and every one of you should come up in here. Because I'm not guessing now. I'm not guessing now. And I join you too. 
You have not broken that list down and said, all right, now I am going to find out what that is and I'm going to get good at it. And then when I get good at knowing that it's in me, I'm going to make sure that everything on that list tries at some point to abound and come out through me to lost people, to save people, to whoever God wants it to come out to, it's coming out. When you realize the grace of God, then you can do that. But let's be honest with each other. If you don't realize how gracious God has been to you, you ain't going to try to get through that list and make it better. You're going to read it and spectate, and when the preacher says, hey, listen, you need to add to your faith virtue, you're going to say, amen, preacher. Come on, amen. Hey, and you need to add to your virtue knowledge. Yep, you're right, preacher. We need to know this book better. We need to have more knowledge of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. But if you don't follow up on that, you're just spectating. This, we, our, our culture, our society has ruined us. When we're put in this setting, we are led to believe that I'm entertaining and you're judging what I say and how I say it. And even body language. We're in such an entertainment type society and culture. But if this is what really should happen. What, what really should happen is I should get along with the Lord over the past week or month or however long it takes for me to put this together and say, now God, what do you want me to say? And then I get from Him what I'm supposed to say and I write this down here because I'm prone to forget that. And then I get up here after I pray and say, God, help me to say it, but help me to say it the right way and help the Holy Spirit to come out and not me. Lord, you know me. I'll do this. I don't want to do that. Help me. And then I deliver that message and then I'm no longer on review. You are. See, in this society, what we do is we drive home and say, well, the preacher did pretty good today or the preacher eh, wasn't his best effort there, you know. And, right? I don't think he knew what he was talking about, right? <laughs> But that's not the way it goes. And you can't flip it either. It's not me driving home thinking, ah, Lord, they didn't get it. You know, they this, they that. It's me delivering the message and then you're on review from your Savior. See, He's looking at you, dealing with you on the way home and over the next few days saying, now, did you hear that? Did you get that? That's my message. You can't just spectate there. You can't just agree Give consent. You've got to actually partake in those things. You'll never do that if you don't realize the grace of God. You won't do it. And he goes into verse 9 and says, if you like those things, you're blind. You can't see it far off. You need, you need help. You need that eye salve that he talks about there in Revelation chapter 3. You need the veil to be removed. God needs to do a work, Right? In your heart, through your eyes, this book has to go down through there and do something and remind you of the grace of God and then so you can start working on those things in 2 Peter chapter 1. Come on, amen? amen. <clears throat> now, come to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and we'll stop there. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is the epitome of the grace of God in Paul's life. <clears throat> and I'll tell you what, Paul actually, I think Paul actually in, ultimately came to this conclusion. Same conclusion that John came to in chapter 3. I must decrease and he must increase. And without a real look at the grace of God on your life, I don't think that's possible. You've got to realize how gracious he's been to you for you to put yourself in your rightful place. Be honest with yourself, Right? And say, so, you know, I'm nothing, I'm nothing apart from the grace of God. So I've, I've decreased. I have to decrease. I have to remind myself to decrease. Anybody else? That's a reminder for me. That's human nature. And then, because of the grace of God, we've got to lift Him up. Right? 2 Corinthians 12, 7. He says, and I, he had a thorn in the flesh here. He talks about it. I think it was something to do with his eyes. I can't prove that, but I think that if you work out a couple of things here, he had some kind of problem with his eyes, and he didn't see as well as he should have, and I think it was a, a, I think it was a gross disease. But nonetheless, he says <clears throat> in verse 7, Unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, he's afraid that he'll be exalted 
that he'll increase and not God because he, a lot of things have been revealed to Paul. He said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. Mm. I think that's probably a problem with his eyes. I, it's, I think it's a physical problem, no doubt. But he says that God gave this to him. It's, but it says the messenger of Satan to buffet me. So God allows Satan to do this to him. Why? Lest I should be exalted above measure. He says he besought the Lord three times to get rid of that. I don't think this was three times where Paul said, uh, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Will you please take this away from me? Amen. I think these were all day and all night, prayer, vigil, fasting, begging, crying, screaming, weeping. God, for three times in an extended session, he said, please take this away from me. And God wouldn't do it. He wouldn't take it away because it's what he needed. You ever try to make a deal with the Lord? When, you're, when you, you get to be my age and you see problems and struggles and real trials and people that go through real, real struggles, you know what you start to do? You start to categorize, okay, Lord, I'll give this up and I'll start this and I, I think I could do this and I think I could do without that. But then you see a problem in someone else's life and you say, not that. I can't do that. I won't do that. I'll do this. I won't do this. But that's not me. You know why we get, that, get to that place? I'm, I'm convinced. We get to that place because we know that all these things we put in this basket, we can take care of on our own. I don't need the Holy Spirit I don't need the Word of God to take care of this. I, I've got that. Many times we probably don't, but we think we do. But when you see God's people, and you see, you're reminded of real struggles, and you look at that, you think, I need God to get through that. I don't know if I can do that. And you sort of push that aside and say, no, 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 no I can't do that. I don't think it's a good idea for us to make deals with the Lord. But I'm on dangerous ground here. It's tough, isn't it? It's hard. It's hard. It's hard to think about some things that could happen that would put you in a place where you'd really, really have to get serious. I don't wish those people, I don't wish things like that on people. I wouldn't wish it on you, wouldn't wish it on myself, wouldn't wish it on anybody. But sometimes things that, that are not good in that time frame happen, and God's still at work. What's he doing? Look at verse 8. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. Verse 9. Here's what the Lord said to Paul. My grace is sufficient for thee, and my strength is made perfect in weakness. You notice how the Lord sometimes just says a quick statement and it works? Just, that's it, and it works. You ever got a, a word from here, just a verse or half a verse or a few words, and it just, just works? It's exactly what you need right on time. He says, Jesus Christ says, my grace is sufficient for thee. And then he says, my strength, Jesus Christ's strength, is made perfect in Paul's weakness. So when you get put into a place where you're weak, then you can show as a safe person how strong he is. But sometimes until you get in that place where you just have, you, you have no bearing on the outcome, you can't control anything, then you have to say, all right, I give up. I can't do that. Lord, you'll have to intervene. If you don't, I'm done for. In the flesh, I don't want to put you in that place. I don't want to see anybody suffer and get in a bad place where you're weak. 
But let's be honest with each other. We do want God to be strong. He is strong. We want others to see His strength. And sometimes that takes us being weak for Him to see that, for everybody, everyone else to see His strength. Am I making any sense? Here's how Paul responds, verse 9. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. God, I want to be in a place where your power rests on me. So many times as a pastor, so many times through the course of the week, the Lord deals with us. Come on, help me out, fellas, preachers. The Lord deals with us and says, now you need to, you need to do this. You need to say this to this person. And I say, oh, Lord, it's bad. You know, God, oh, man. I don't want And they, they don't want to hear that anyway. And I got somewhere to go. And it's just, it's just as clear as day. The Lord says, do you want power on Sunday morning at 1130? <sighs> yes. All right, do that. All right. <laughs> and if you don't want the power, you won't do it. You know what psychiatrists and psychologists would think about Paul right here? If he really testified and got real with them and told them what he was up to? The God that made us had a son and he died for me in my place. So now I'm saved and I'm going to heaven and I'm going to live in glory forever in a glorified body, right? So, so... There's some times in my life when I actually don't care to have an infirmity or a sickness. And in fact, I'll take that most gladly. I'll glory in it. And then in verse 10, I'll take pleasure in it. Huh? You're, you're mental, Paul. You're, you're, you have a problem. Bad things are happening to you. You don't have a home. You don't have a church. You don't have a Sunday school ministry. You don't have anything. And you're telling me you don't have anything, but your response to that is gladness, glory, and I take pleasure in that. You are a madman. But you can't expect the lost and dying world to understand the grace of God and what it means to us. And how we want them to view our Savior versus how they view us right now. Who cares how they view us right now? What will matter is eternity, right? Right? If he is strong, then I'm made weak, so you would say that the opposite would be true. If I'm made strong and I pick the problems only that I can fix and I fix them, you know what the world thinks of our Savior? You know what's wrong with Christianity right now in America? Lost people think it's weak. Because we have our plans and our programs and we know how to build a Sunday school and we know how to do this and we have our outlines and we can preach our outlines and we know how to do visitation and we've got this social media thing down pat and we can do this and we can do that and we've, put, we've picked all these things that we can handle and the world looks at that and says, well, that ain't nothing. You all can handle that. We do that in the lost and dying world. We've come up with our systems and we have more money than you do and more people than you do. So your God, whoever He is, is weak because you're strong. That's a shame, isn't it? <clears throat> That's not how it's supposed to be. Right? The right way, the right way will bring glory to God. The right way. What is that? God? You've been really gracious to me. Oh, overly gracious to me. And I don't deserve it. The good is from your grace. The bad allows your grace to put the blood on that and get rid of it. Amen. So in light of that, I'm going to try to learn that list and, and abound and get good at it. Right? And when things happen... I'm just going to attribute it to the grace of God and I'm going to be glad and take pleasure and glory in it because this thing will be over before you know it and I don't want to end up like Naomi and stroll into heaven saying, call me Mara, I'm bitter. That's not the way you want to leave out of here. By the way of the grave or if the rapture takes place. Come on, Amen. amen.
All right, let's stand for prayer. Lord, thank you for the great...